Good evening. I'd like to call the Monday, November 7th, regularly scheduled uh, Berlin Select Board meeting to order. Uh, with us tonight on my left is Flo Smith and Joe Staub. On my right, Carl Parton. And with us also is Vince Conti, our town administrator, and Diane Isabel, town treasurer. And um, additions or changes to the agenda? One addition. That's the chief is here. We've requesting a little bit of a short executive session to discuss uh, personnel issue. Um, public comment? Hearing none, uh, Good Samaritan update, Rick DeAngelis. That's me. <laughs> uh, should I just sit here or Whatever. whatever? Wherever you're comfortable. Okay, great. There's Dave. There's Dave. Yes. Uh, while we're waiting for this gentleman to come in, I'd like to pass out a little bit of information that I have, and I'll, I took the liberty of preparing, and I'll tell you what it is. One, uh, the first sheet is just a cover memo for me with telling you who's been staying at the, what we call the Welcome Center, where the Twin City Motel is. Uh, this. And the chief, can I give you one? Sure. Uh, that's all I have, sorry. Um, so I'm Rick DeAngelis, I'm the co-executive director of the Good Samaritan Haven. And um, I thought I would take um, maybe about five, at the most, ten minutes to go over this, and then open it up to questions. Does that sound sure. okay? Um, so before I comment on this cover sheet, I have to I'd like to say something, give you the big picture. Um, you know, I've been working in housing for, believe it or not, more than 35 years. And going back to uh, working at the Pine Street Inn in Boston uh, in the mid-1980s. So, uh, and then I've had a long career in affordable housing. And uh, I'll tell you, I have never seen anything like the situation we have uh, today with homelessness, not only in Washington County, but in the state of Vermont and all across the United States. It's really unprecedented. And, uh, you know, we've long had homelessness in urban areas, but now what's happening is we have it in a lot of rural communities as well. And uh, if you were to Google uh, homelessness uh, New Hampshire, you'd see all these towns in uh, across New Hampshire that are having issues with the homeless. If you Google homelessness Maine, you'd see the same thing in Maine. So this is not just a local problem. It's really all over. I, I actually do a talk that I call The Perfect Storm that talks about this situation and all the things that have contributed to it. But we don't have time for that tonight. So for Good Samaritan Haven, you know, we've been in the, the community, the area for 35 years. Our approach to responding to this because we are the lead organization on homelessness in Washington County, is really two, three things I'd say. One is we want to have decent and safe facilities that are not overcrowded and that can't be managed. We were in one old single family house in Barry for 30, 35 years, and we knew we had it to do something different. So um, now we have uh, three facilities and um, and we will also be involved in managing a fourth this winter. Another thing we've tried to do is uh, spread the load around. Uh, believe me, I am aware that homelessness can have an impact on a community, on a neighborhood. And um, so the four shelter programs we're going to be running this winter uh, will be in the town of Barry, the city of Barry, Berlin, and the city of Montpelier. Uh, we think it makes more sense to decentralize the shelter system. So, um, and I guess, the, the, well, the last thing that I would say about how we're trying to respond to the problem is have good facilities, good programming, and programming that includes real case management services and also has focuses on health care. Health care is a very big issue for people who have become impoverished like this. So that's the, the big picture. Now I want to tell you a little bit about what we've uh, experienced at uh, what was the Twin City Motel 
uh, which we now call the Welcome Center. I guess the first thing to say is it's a beautiful facility, and uh, I'm not sure if any, the chief has been there, and uh, you probably passed by it. It's, um, we, we are really blessed to have such a great facility. It's efficient, modern, clean, looks good, and, um, and we are committed to keeping it that way. We have a, a pretty significant reserve fund that's gonna help us maintain that property, and I think that's important. So our very first guest was a veteran, a 70-year-old veteran. Uh, he was bouncing around from couches to living in his car, and uh, and uh, and he came to our he came to our facility. Uh, I'm pleased to say that he was able to reunite with some family. Within about a month, I'd say he was uh, uh, he was on to a better situation. So since that first visitor, we've had 62 different guests, and you can take a look at um, the overview I've provided. And I don't know what you think about that, but How are you doing, okay. Joe Allsworth? Hi, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, <coughs> I'm just giving this uh, select board a little overview of our new uh, shelter facility. So I don't know what your reaction is to that demographic, but I, I compiled these numbers and I was surprised by them. Um, two things really stood out to me um, is the number of people who are employed, and uh, secondly, the number of people who have serious health care issues. And that has become a, a really big issue for us. To the extent, uh, in one case, uh, we, uh, we had an individual who was sent down from uh, UVM Medical Center. You know, they gave us a certain description of who he was. And when he arrived in the ambulance, we were taken aback by the level of his need, uh, including, you know, he had to have uh, his adult diapers changed on a regular basis and, and so on. And uh, we said, we just can't accept this guy. And uh, we actually did have to call the ambulance service that night to take him up to see a CVMC and say, we just, we cannot have this individual here. So that is a really striking problem, is people who have poor health and they have nowhere to go and the healthcare system cannot accommodate them. Um, these other things here too are also surprising to me. The number of older people, and among the, and it's generally among the older people that you're seeing the veterans as well. So I want to just make a few comments about safety, and uh, how how do we manage the welcome center? Um, it's not always easy. Let me tell you, uh, things do come up, and um, but we are doing our best to make that the highest priority. And we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, one is we have a clear statement of what our expectations are. And that is the second and third sheet in this package, and I'll make a couple of points about that. So there's that. Uh, secondly, we move people around amongst our different shelters on a, mm, close to a daily basis. If somebody doesn't fit in at seminary, it, well, if somebody is doing really well at Seminary Street in Barrie, and they think that, that they can do even better, we'll move them to the Welcome Center. Because there they have a semi-private room, they have more independence, and so forth. If they're not doing well at the Welcome Center, we can move them back to Seminary Street, or we may move them to our, our facility in the town of Barry. And this winter there will also be a fourth, what we call an overflow shelter and, uh, in Montpelier, and the overflow shelter uh, for lack of a better word, it houses the tougher, toughest crowd of all. There are people who are living outside, and many of those folks are, you know, they're really struggling with some kind of substance abuse or severe mental illness. Um, oh, uh, the last thing, uh, regrettably, is that um, we require people to leave. We call it exiting. and. Um, and uh, out of the 62 people who have been at the Welcome Center so far, we have exited eight people. So it's not an insignificant number. 
and uh, but we feel it's something we just have to do sometimes. Any questions so far about the demographics and that sort of thing? Sure. Um, actually, I don't see. Let's see. It. We don't have anything here for like the substance abuse issues. Well, it, it's, it's definitely a problem. It's yeah. not measured. Okay. Um, all of these things here are, uh, there is what somebody has stated to us. Uh, we're not doing a diagnosis to determine if they have mental illness. Um, uh, so it's, it's self-attested. Okay. So don't, I, it's, it's a significant issue. For sure. And then you're calling this the welcome center. This is not necessarily the first first stop. And then you, you evaluate and then move them appropriately, right? This is just, that's just a name. The Correct, welcome center. yes. Okay. Yes. And the first stop is usually Seminary Street. There are some people who are at the welcome center. It, it was their first stop because we made an, an assessment that they'd be a good fit. So on to, I just gave you a sample of um, what we call our resident manual, just to give you an idea of what we expect from people. And uh, sir, you just asked about the, uh, the alcohol here, uh, alcohol use. It is something we definitely have to uh, be on top of as much as possible. And you'll see the last item on the page, uh, please help us prevent harm from excessive drug and alcohol use. They are not allowed on our campus. Uh, breathalyzer tests are usually given every night, and our, our blood alcohol limit is 0.08, which is the legal limit uh, for driving a vehicle, I believe. And, um, and if someone is over that number, we, have, we invite them to take a walk, and sometimes by taking a walk, they can get below that limit, but if they can't, get below that limit, we ask that we require them to leave for the night. Now that becomes more of an issue in the winter time. You could be asking somebody to leave on a bitterly cold night. You could be putting their life in danger. And, uh, and we're talking about that right now and trying to strategize on how we might keep our campus safe, but at the same time uh, not put somebody's life at risk. Um, just some other things here um, on that first page you see it says sorry visitors are not uh, permitted in guest rooms and in fact we strongly discover, uh, discourage and try to prevent having any any guests at all on the campus but sometimes people do need rides and somebody's there to pick them up or so forth uh, take a look at the last sheet Uh, you know, that last section there, uh, you get an idea of, you know, again, some of the things that we do to keep the Welcome Center safe. You know, we, we check the rooms every night. We check on people twice a day. Uh, we're checking belongings. We can do that. We have the right to do that. We have cameras um, throughout the property. And like I said earlier, we do end people's stay we will do it immediately if we need to, and um, it's, it's an unfortunate thing, but there's, it's potentially too many things could go wrong to take chances, so we try to be strict about that. How long can a resident stay? 90 days. Um, as long as they obey the basic rules, they can stay for 90 days, and if they are working on an exit plan, uh, we will extend it beyond 90 days because the reality is it's very hard to get housing within 90 days in this market. In fact, it's really hard to get housing at all in this market. Uh, we've had people on waiting lists. Uh, you know, they're, they're good, they're potentially good tenants and applicants, but they, it just takes a long time to get to the top of the list. In the beginning, when you first proposed this uh, this project, wasn't it less than ninety to get ninety days that you thought somebody a resident would stay? Well, ninety days has always been our okay. uh, baseline that you have ninety days, 
and um, some people leave before then. As you can see, well, you can't tell from the demographics, but uh, some people do leave before 90 days, and uh, they could be leaving for all kinds of reasons. So, Rick, I just had a question real quick. Uh, out of these four locations, like, say, Seminary Street, how many, how many beds do you have at Seminary Street? We have 15 at Seminary, although we increase that to 20 in the wintertime. What about in the Welcome Center House, how many? Well, we have a legal max of 35, but as we have, uh, this average is out. Uh, the numbers we've had so far have averaged. For October, for September and Octo October, they averaged about 24 a night. And actually, I, I think we will probably stay below 30. I'm just not comfortable going up to the maximum. And then the Barry Town facility? That's 15. And what about Montpelier is going to be? Is that going to be more? That's 10. 10 beds. Where's that in Montpelier? At the Christ Church. I just want to make a comment, and, and not really knowing, and, and, but when you came to us at first, it was going to be a zero tolerance for alcoholic drugs. And in my mind, 0.08 is not a zero tolerance. I mean, because there's some of these people that... that 0.04 become <laughs> combative and stuff like that. Have you been experiencing any of that stuff? Things have definitely happened. There have been eight people exited, and um, and reasons. it's always you know if there is a regular yeah. kind of push and shove on the alcohol thing. I mean the reality is there's a number of people who have been struggling with alcohol and other things for years, and um, you know we try to work with them and to help them. And uh, and to try to keep it under control. And is is Washington County Mental Health involved with you up there? Get some counselors. They have a um, a clinician on site once a week. Is that the process you follow when they're exited, as well as contacting Washington County Mental Health to help them with the exiting, or how does that occur? Well, they before? they don't have any emergency. They have some emergency housing for their own clients. Um, but they don't have anything beyond that. We are the emergency housing mm -hmm. resource in the mm -hmm. county. So when people are exited, um, I, we try to find another, help them find another solution, but sometimes there's no other solution. And in fact, I mean, one of the most challenging incidents that occurred in our, since we've been there is uh, we had a gentleman who struck one of our staff members uh, he actually hurt him pretty significantly. And um, so that gentleman was exited immediately. I think he ran off or something. And, um, but he you know, began to loiter around the property. So, um, so, you know, people are just, there are some people who are just out there uh, camping and on the streets and under bridges and so forth. Have you had any of the local businesses come to you with any concerns? Uh, no, although uh, the chief did speak to me on behalf of one of the businesses. I actually had an interaction with one that they've had an increase in their, in their numbers about 30% in shoplifting. Since what facility. business is that? Can you say? Or? Uh, I prefer okay. not to. They wanted to, but it was a manager of one of the facilities. I just was wondering if, if during the daytime, as these people come and go, are they monitored other than your cameras? I mean, like, they're just free. Just, when they're off the property? Yeah. When they, do they come and go during the day from the property, just randomly? Well, they are free to come and go during the day. There is a curfew in the evening. Okay. This is an excellent uh, outline of, of rules and expectations. What do you have for staffing to actually, because there's a lot of, uh, it's a very hands-on interactive form of, I don't want to say policing, but interaction with your, with your, uh, right. your, your residents. Um, how many people do we you have? We have an operational staff who run the facility, and there's two of those folks on at any, given, at any time. Uh -huh. And uh, then we also have our administrative and our case management staff is also on the property. So during the day, there's, there's more staffing there.
How much um, problems do you have getting people to leave if you're taking them out for uh, alcohol abuse or whatever? If they're if they're exited. Yeah. Well, they generally leave. Um, I mean, they always leave because they're just not allowed to be in the room. Uh, the room is closed to them. And um, I mean, I, the one incident we've had that was troubling was this indivi individual that I mentioned who came back and was loitering around the property. And, is that uh, the same individual that assaulted? Yes, yes. So um, I'm not sure what to, I mean, generally speaking, though, people just, you know, they do leave. I had a question just I seen uh, recently on the news that Burlington <clears throat> has these pods and just asking if you have any insight of what those pod units cost per unit. Do you have any they're idea? In the, I think they're in the $40,000 range, something like that. They're pretty well individually contained, little small one. My issue with those, that approach is the supervision. Of it. Yeah, no, I understand. I was just curious. Yeah. Because there is a, uh, and I've been more involved lately, there is a huge need for housing. Uh, we've got the mental health issue and, and the substance abuse issue, and it's huge, but how do you handle it, you know? I mean, I guess you guys are doing a pretty good job of it, what you can do, but that's really small in numbers for what we need in central Vermont. And, I mean, because we've got the hilltop that, that has become, you know, uh, an issue, you know, for the police department and stuff like that when it gets over thing. So I don't know that there's any one quick answer on how you fix this, but at least you guys are doing something though. It is a forward. it is a very vexing problem, and um, <coughs> I'm not sure what the solution is either. Um, we tried different things all the time and talk about different approaches. Uh, I, I quite frankly, it would be my desire someday to have this, even fewer people in this facility, maybe one person to a room. Most of the rooms are doubles now. And, um, but again, you know, there's such a need that it's hard to argue for that um, when there are so many people that need a place to stay. Well, then, too, it's like this, the Montpelier one, I think I, I'm Dave Sawyer, by the way, and yes, spoke with you. I thought so. It's getting somebody to man man these things overnight, uh, the volunteers to to be there to help you man, like even the Christ Church is at, at 10 beds, uh, because I talked with the woman there in Montpelier, and she was right. saying how it's, it just isn't the people to, to do it, to, to help staff it. Staffing is very challenging, and I'm actually not in favor of having volunteers work in the shelter, it, especially like that overflow shelter in Montpelier. <coughs> it's too tough a crowd, and um, just uh, things things can happen, and um, I don't think it's appropriate for somebody to be volunteering for that. So, yeah. But it looks like it's going to happen. We're working with another group uh, to, to operate it together. So a lot of things are blamed on COVID over the last couple of years, and you're talking about the perfect storm. And I was trying to think, Vermont's, from a larger demographic perspective, Vermont's population is decreasing, yet the housing availability is also decreasing. Is it because, and in the COVID surge, a lot of people bought second escape homes in Vermont, so there are a lot of unoccupied houses in Vermont that, so to, that decreases the available housing for the average person? I mean, I'm throwing that out there just as a philosophical question, but that, that probably hurts us, right, at this point? Second and third home, I, perhaps, unoccupied homes in Probably Vermont. people and, like me that are, yeah. you know, should have downsized and moved into a smaller unit and made our house available, you know, mm -hmm. for, a, for another new household. I don't, there's a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, it, uh, Vermont Business Magazine recently did a study and they found that Vermont has the second lowest vacancy rate in the country. Um, so that's tough. And I don't know if any of you have relatives, friends, children 
that are looking for apartments in this area, it's really tough. Yeah. And I've talked to two that are 20 and 21 years old, and they, they've numerous applications with no callbacks or, or, or anything. This is probably in your ballpark. Who's doing it right? In, if, if you looked around the nation. Sure, yeah. Well, I, a lot of people point to Houston, Texas. Um, they have a program where, um, and it, you know, this costs money. You can imagine it, when someone becomes homeless, as soon as possible, they are subsidized <coughs> on what they call a supportive housing permanent unit. So they get in an apartment with supports um, almost immediately. And, um, and the idea is you don't want people to get entrenched in homelessness. You don't want them out on the street. And um, so that would be the, I guess, the gold standard. And, uh, but think about how hard that is to do. Um, you gotta produce the units. I mean, Houston is a big city. Um, you know, I think they've been pretty go go on development and so forth, but it takes a long time to develop housing here in Vermont. If you're familiar with Down Street, the project they've been working on here in Berlin, uh, that's been on the works for th three years, I think. So, Houston has, they've got some apartments that have eight, nine hundred units. So yeah, so <laughs> maybe crazy. that's how they can do it. Yeah. They've got that's the inventory. Huge. Have you thought of doing the breathalyzer tests earlier in the day? You mentioned that you do it in the evenings and that as winter comes, that will be difficult to exit in the later hour of the evening, per se. Have you thought about doing it at a different time? Well, that's, I'll bring that back to my staff. We'll bring it up. Uh, in our experience, the drinking happens during the day. People leave and, um, you know, and they go out and they... Some, get alcohol somewhere and they drink it somewhere and then they come back mm -hmm. later in the evening. Mm -hmm. So so based on when they return, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. yes. Right. So do they have a set time they do that breathalyzer or is as you're seeing them start to return? We do it in the early evening, okay. like from six to nine in that range. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody has been out and they're coming back at, at uh, 10 o'clock, we do it be when they return. But if they were to come back at 5 o'clock, you wouldn't necessarily do it at 4 or 5 o'clock? Probably not, no. Could we do it in that, that early evening shift? Okay. <coughs> and the, I don't want to make it seem like we've got everything figured out there. This is still a work in progress, you know, a brand new facility. And, um, you know, and we're doing our best. Is there a work requirement for any of the residents down there? Encourage, not required. Uh, I'm actually surprised the number who are working. And, um, you know, some people just, they could not work. They're either too yeah. sick or too frail or uh, whatever it is. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Yeah, and for sure. all your efforts as well. I really appreciate the uh, warm welcome. and. Uh, Thanks to the chief, he's uh, he's been a real ally, uh, both here. We have staff at the Hilltop too, and we understand that it's very challenging there. I think things have gotten a little bit better. Are you finding that by taking a hard line, you're getting it's easier to uh, screen your applicants? I. Uh, it's tough on the screening because think of it like this: people come to us, they're desperately in need and they're at your door, they show up, and uh, you want to house them. That's our ethic. The yeah. people and the staff care, they want to help. And, uh, and uh, you know, you do an intake, it's hard to do a very, very tough screening, but I have to say, your question's right on point. You know, we are looking again in our intake and our screening process and thinking maybe we should do this on an application basis um, and, and have a more thorough screening so we're not, we're minimizing the risk or lessening the risk at least. It's a tough choice. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Jan Luce? I guess I, I just one more. Is there an absolute emergency uh, location 
heated location uh, that that folks could be taken to, like a, a, a barn with a with a wood stove in it somewhere. I mean, no. you know, a, a garage or something. I mean, whatever. Especially in the, I'm thinking of January and February. And yeah, right. Yeah, there's well, um, you know about this. We've talked about this a lot with the chief. Um, uh, that's why we are trying so very hard to get the Christchurch up and running. That's really the end of the line there. And uh, there is nothing beyond that that I'm aware of. During the day, we set up a warming shelter at the library down in Bear City. So that's open during the, uh, the, top, uh, the hours that they're open. So uh, they are working on uh, getting staff for that with the opera funds to uh, staff that at the Aldridge Library, but right now it's still in the infant stages. So. Do you have a rough idea, Chief, in Barry City? How many homeless do you think you have in Barry City? So that number is, is, is kind of uh, a, a moving target because they're very transient. They will go back and forth between the two cities using Berlin as a conduit. Um, so last time that I was told we had approximately 45 that were on the street, and then uh, we do have a couple of smaller encampments. We do uh, go to the meeting uh, monthly, and, and we meet with Don Little, who also is at the outreach, and so she keeps a pretty good tab on that. But it fluctuates, so we get folks from outside of the area that will come in from White River or Burlington, and that's so it's very hard to, to really picture what the consistent numbers are. So. Um, we'll see new faces every now and then, and they'll like, you know, they'll tell us, "Oh yeah, we came up from Hartford or stuff like that." So. Well, I uh, thank you very much. I actually have another meeting to go yeah. to. I'm one minute late right now, so. Uh, <laughs> okay. But thanks for the warm welcome. Yeah. Thank you. For thank you. Uh, let's see here, appointment of Jim Ryan to the Seminary Commission. Yes, Mr. Ryan is here. Um, and this is the appointment letter after you please make sure you all agree. Sign it. Mr. Ryan has already done some volunteer work in, in the cemeteries and expressed an interest to, uh, to get on the cemetery commission. Thank you for volunteering. And, uh, Does anybody know when they meet or anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, I'm not, I know, I'm not sure they are meeting. So there's another fairly new member that I'm reaching out to to uh, try to uh, get that up and running again. So, okay. I move to accept the appointment of Jim Ryan to Cemetery Commission. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Ask you any questions this time? Right? <laughs> you got them all last time. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Yeah, free to leave? Yeah, unless okay. you've got some questions for, <laughs> for, for us. No, I guess I'm all set. We Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got uh, Capital Mutual Aid Fire Presentation. That would be me. Yep. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is uh, Interim Chief Joe Alter from the Bear City Fire Department. I'm um, also the Vice President for the Capital Fire Mutual Aid. Um, just an update on the, uh, the radio system that your uh, uh, fire and fast squad folks are being dispatched on. That uh, system was actually a grant that was received from, it's an earmark grant from Senator Leahy back in the 90s. So right now that system is approximately 30 years in aging old. Uh, most of that sit, uh, the towers are not interconnected. Um, basically, they took advantage of some of the existing agreements that were out there, and they put that equipment up um, to get the current radio systems that you have now. Um, we've been trying through the years try to, do, to replace that system, and really we just have not been able to uh, get the funding and, and um, the mechanism to get it going. Uh, we did have uh, Burlington Communications do an independent audit. Um, they said that it is aging, um, it is very hard to find equipment to replace those to notify our first responders. Um, so CBPSA, the City of Barrie, City of Montpelier, 
um, teamed up together. We hired a consultant uh, from Televate. They are a communications uh, consultant that specialized in uh, telecommunications. And we looked at all aspects. Um, basically, we said, here, this is what we currently have. This is what we're proposing. Um, tell us if it'll work, what improvements we'll make, and what to expect out of the improvements. Uh, they uh, did this study, and they agreed that the uh, investment in the uh, infrastructure was critical and that we needed to move forward with that. They also helped us in designing um, the system into a uh, simulcast system. Basically, the simulcast system means that the nine towers on the, the mountaintops would go off all at the same time. We had some problems with balance, and the balance is, is that we had to add a tower in Northfield, and we had to add a tower over in Chelsea, basically to strengthen the signal for the area so that if Chief Staub was over in uh, Moortown and he could not hear what was going on here for his Berlin Fire Department, or um, the Chelsea Chief was over here in Berlin at Walmart shopping, he would be able to hear his folks go out and respond appropriately. So we looked at that system, it was very effective. Currently what they do is uh, in places like Middlesex and Moortown, um, they can't hear their tones effectively from the locations. So they have to do multiple tones. So the dispatchers are doing double the duty to try to get the same uh, emergency response out there. So we're, go we're planning to alleviate that. So what we did is we took the study, we engineered it through Televate, um, and we took that study and we went to the state. The state, on the same time, is shedding approximately 110 agencies. They are having problems with dispatchers. And they provide free dispatching services to a number of communities. A number of those are uh, fire and ambulance, a few police agencies also. So they notified them approximately 18 months ago that, hey, listen, the state's getting out of dispatching uh, services, and we'll, you'll have to find another location to dispatch. Now, some of the agencies have pre-existing agreements that the state will honor, and they will stick by that so that you won't have to worry about that end of it. I believe the Berlin PD has that existing agreement, and they, they're not in jeopardy of that at all. But the other agencies will have to be go somewhere else. With our system, we've actually proposed to pick up Chelsea, uh, Northfield PD. Uh, Warren came on this last month here. And so we're really trying to lock it in. Approximately 750 miles, about seven, uh, 75,000 people, plus the daytime influx, which is hard to guess. But from what I'm understanding for the Chamber of Commerce, it's about 100,000 people throughout the area. So we're trying to cover that. Uh, large amount of distance. One of the things we're running into is mass, glass, and distance. Mass are the mountains that we run through, glass is the buildings, and distance between the towers, and so that's why we're adding those additional towers. So we were trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to fund this? The legislature got on board, Capitol Fire, Barry Montpelier sent folks to the legislature, testified on multiple times. Uh, they came up with some uh, state grant funding that they were going through and we tendered an application using the city of Montpelier as a fiduciary and we were tentatively awarded 2.44 million. The total cost of the upgrade is about 3.23. So you're like, okay Joe, that's about a million one short. What do we do with that? So as we're going through, there's going to be a phase two of the grant funding. So once we get official notice in uh, December, then we can move forward, get the project rolling, and then uh, apply for phase two funding to finish that off. The project will last about 18 months. Um, it'll be upgrading that uh, the whole system. Uh, Barry Montpelier said that, listen, we have customers for this area and that we feel that the dispatching infrastructure should be on each of the cities. So they went and uh, they purchased uh, consoles and furniture and they're upgrading both their facilities. They also have a conduit, uh, fiber optic conduit, that goes between both facilities that will uh, create a backup redundancy for dispatching with them. And so that really makes it a uh, failover capable, which is very good and, and attractive to the state, which the state does not currently have. 
so they've agreed to become a tertiary dispatching backup for us, vice versa. So we fostered that with Terry LaValle and we're working forward with that with them. Uh, one thing that the governor did say is like, hey listen, we're gonna, we know how bad the infrastructure is and how old it is, but we don't want you back. So what happened was is that we created this spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is a uh, way of paying it forward so that the chiefs that are uh, forced with the radio system now for capital fire does not have to come back and say, hey, our hands are open for some more money because, again, it's antiquated. The radio system lasts with the new technology estimated to be 10 and 12 years. So Manager Shefleck from the town of Waterbury, who is very good with numbers, offered to come up with this spreadsheet. And basically what he did is he took the, the allocated grant list for each of the communities, and that's how he came up with their numbers. So the town of Berlin is approximately $5,500 uh, annually on a sliding increase. And you can see that across for the 10-year period. Basically, in the end, if it's invested correctly, it's approximately just shy of a, a million dollars. Um, it, it really at the whim of investments. And I actually had a third-party um, investment uh, analyst look at this, and he said it's a very sound way of uh, saving for the future. So basically, it's like if you're saving for a fire truck, and you put money aside each month. And you say, okay, listen, this is my savings plan at the end of 10 years or 20 years. When you're ready to buy a fire truck, you have that money on hand. But basically, that's what we're trying to do for the radio system next year. So basically, what Chief wanted me to come in and advise you folks is that your dues went up a little bit for Capital Fire Mutual Aid. It's probably $400 a year, and that is to uh, pay for the connections to the towers and any of our day-to-day -day business for managing the radio system and capital fire mutual aid, but also your capital improvements plan portion is about $5,500 a year and that we would be asking the uh, towns to please move ahead and budget that as an annual payment to capital fire to into a uh, capital improvements plan dedicated for the replacement of the, uh, the radio system. One thing we don't want is to get ourselves into the situation next time around and there are a lot of people that say, hey, what about cellular and, and uh, you know, the broadband folks? We did go to them. We went to Velco. Uh, we have some positions on their towers that they're offering us. AT&T and Verizon are coming along. But that's really technology that's 10 years from now. And right now there are dead spots in your, in your communities that you can't really reach with a cell phone. And it's very hard for a firefighter to take this $1,500 phone into a fire and try to work it with their wet fire gloves and then expect this to be working afterwards. This is not reliable inside a building. This is very well known and it's very cumbersome when you have zero uh, environment to be able to see in or you cannot touch. So we, so we have to be very realistic. Our portable radios, we want to be able to key them up, push down the man button and have somebody answer that when that when that firefighter's in need and try to find a lost firefighter. So this system will improve this dramatically. The system was capable to uh, interact with future LTE developments. We've looked at that. We also d designed the system to say, listen, most of the fire departments can't afford to upgrade their pagers and portables and mobiles all at once. So what we designed was this mixed mode system. Basically, it integrates P25 and digital and the antiquated older technologies so that that allows you folks to budget down the road to say I'm going to replace that but be realistic. The other thing that we did on the uh, RFP is that we incorporated um, special pricing for those radios for those uh, communities that are looking to uh, upgrade their portables for two budget cycles so that they would hold the price in for two budget cycles so that we can move forward. I thought with that was very great, uh, uh, smart thing, especially economy of scale issues, especially when we can do some bulk buying. So um, I think I've covered most of it. Chief, did I, I'm good, I good or did I miss something? Or? No, you, you covered everything. Um, I think just, so what you're looking at on your spreadsheet is in addition to our current dispatching fees. What are we currently with? Somewhere around 53, just under 53,000. 
So if I may address that, your, your dispatching fees are different from your capital plan that's in front of you. Your dispatching fee, fees pay for dispatchers' butts in the seats. That pays for them to, to, to be able there. That's staffing. That is so that we can keep the lights on and move it forward. So this right here, this is a, a savings plan so that we're not coming back. Because if we had to come back to each of the individual towns for $3.23 million to upgrade everything, just imagine what it was going to cost. I mean, it would be astronomically, and everybody would be that shock and awe. So we're trying to do this realistically and, and respectively, but we're also trying to utilize state funding, which is there now. Um, we have been working with multiple agencies and trying to make it work. There are some members of the public that have uh, popped up some questions that we've tried to answer, um, and I'm sure that you folks get that on a regular basis. Um, I will tell you that Chief Pete and I have been working in this for the last 18 months, and uh, we're at the point where I think we're, we're comfortable to say we're ready to move with the first step. But also, I have to do my due diligence, and what the commissioner and the governor has said is, we need to save for the future. We need to put this money aside, and this was the easiest way that we could come up with. So some of the smaller towns had some issues. We originally came up with the 5,000 per community, but some of these towns only have 650 folks in there. So it really was not economically feasible because it was half of their budget what they were planning to put away. So what Manager Sheplet came up with was the uh, amortized grand list fee that you see there in the main column. So I have a question. Uh, um, it seems like this is, is very critical infrastructure and the state is certainly willing to get on board with grant funding and even in a very divided uh, federal government from time to time uh, this is pretty bipartisan as far as getting emergency critical infrastructure grants I, I'd have to assume that uh, a project such as this would be supported both state and federally so through, we, through we did funding. apply for uh, earmark funding from Sanders, Leahy, and uh, uh, Congressman Welch, and we did not make the cut on that. Um, so we actually prepared uh, the request as they wanted us, and we were not successful in that. We attempted this to 12 years ago to do the same thing on a smaller scale, and we again, we were turned down for that. So one of the other things that we looked into, the, assistant fire, the assistance to firefighter grant, and the communications portion, they put a cap on it, $50,000. And because if we were to turn around and say, hey, listen, we need 3.23 million, here's our study, here's this, here's that, we'd suck out that major portion of the funding that's been allocated to Vermont. And so that's why they did that, is they put a cap on it. So basically, that assistance to firefighters grant is a $50,000 cap that's mainly for portables and, and, and uh, pagers. Fifty thousand for region or per per town per grant, so per per applicant. Even if there was a regional approach to that, yeah. and I actually asked that very question to Chief Parr, who is the the region's representative, who does the AFG. Uh, and what's the show. what's the term of the fifty thousand dollar limit? It's annually, and it's annually. only if appropriated by the federal government. So. You have to understand that there's a lot of people waving their hands saying, I need, I need, I need. And there's always SCBAs and turnout gear and trucks and you name it, people are putting that in. So, And they have their own identified um, portion every year of saying, this is what we're going to focus on this year. One of it's retention and recruitment. Other thing is physical fitness or health and safety. So you, once that priority is identified annually, Everything else goes to the bottom, and so you're really not making that priority. So what may be a priority to us isn't a priority set by the EFG folks. So this is just a new line item of 6200 to stop, start it off with for next year. That's You'll see that uh, incorporated into the dispatch. Yeah. It's spread out over 10 years. It's like 1.3% increase a year for 10 years, so it's not, I mean, it's not a big increase, but. And we try to be reasonable too. I mean, I understand it's, it's not cheap, but also it's, a, it's critical infrastructure and we need to be able to plan for it appropriately. Luckily, we've been able to negotiate 
through the waters that have been set out through the legislature and you know, knock on wood, everything should be fine in, in December so we can really move forward. It's an 18 month project. It's not easy to do. Uh, I've been up to the mountaintop several times up in Berlin, um, just trying to bring it through and make sure we evaluate them. I've been to each of the radio sites. Um, some of them are duct tape and, and bubble gum. And so the, 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 the rodents are in there. Uh, several of them are, don't have generator backup. What we've designed is, is that every one of them will have redundancy backup. Have battery power and a generator so and a lot of that is through connections with Valco and AT&T and, and, and folks like that that have agreed to, to provide their, their generator connection Norwich University was one of the other one so we really try to explore that we try to do microwave as much as we can utilizing the bandwidth from Valco doing a public-private uh, cooperation and I have to give them a big shout out Valco has been huge and, and helping us try to move this project forward. Seems to me a very thoughtful approach. It's obvious a lot of time and effort went into it. I commend you for that. Thank you. Yeah, very well done. Any other questions, sir? Mutual aid. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, discussion and decision with uh, Chief Police on purchase of two vehicles. So we budgeted a vehicle um, for this year, which has yet to be ordered. Um, there's an issue with Ford Explorers. Do you open the door for uh, Chief? <laughs> The Ford Explorers that we normally go to are pretty much um, off the market. Um, the company that I have been dealing with said so there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 7,000 orders canceled at the last minute. So departments that have been waiting on them for months um, were all of a sudden told, well, you're not getting them now, um, and have to kind of recalibrate and come up with a better plan. Um, having said that, they can get us Tahoes. It seems like the Chevy Tahoes are more available. It'll be a little bit more expensive than the Explorers, but they're pretty much on their lot, ready to go. Um, so I'm asking for the board's permission to go ahead and give the green light to what was budgeted for that vehicle. Somewhere in the neighborhood of forty-one thousand. We budgeted. <laughs> we budgeted forty-five. Forty-five thousand. Forty-five yeah. thousand. And the car, and the ink, and that's for one. That's for, that's one. for one vehicle. Hey, what's the lag time on these? Um, probably four months. By the time I can see it, I've been without my cruiser, my take-home cruiser now for at least two months, and it doesn't look like I'll be getting it anytime soon. They're telling me December now, so, and that. Uh, by contract, I'm supposed to have a vehicle. So uh, right now, unless I take one out of the fleet and leave the patrol short, that's not happening. I've been using my personal vehicle. You mentioned that Cody's had one down there. They still have that one no. down that was water. They took <laughs> it's it. It's gone, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm also asking for the board's permission to be proactive and go ahead and give me the green light to um, purchase a Ford Explorer with the consideration that it's probably going to be nine months before I can actually get it here. It was just not budgeted for currently. But our fleet is literally the wheels are falling off of it on a weekly That's basis. The, the, year the bills are, you know, when we do bring it to be repaired, they're $1,000 a pop. Uh, just, just so you're aware, tonight I have the uh, budget package for you to take home and review. In the fiscal year 23 budget, I have budgeted for two police vehicles. You'll see that in there as well for, for the next year's budget. So by the time that vehicle, if you order it now, by the time it comes in, we'll be in fiscal year 23. Okay. Yeah. And, that, and that budget starts July 1, right? Correct. I'd be willing to make a motion to let the chief uh, purchase the vehicles on the budget amount and also retain the second vehicle that is budgeted in the uh, 23 budget. 
I second that based on the need and the explanation. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Public Works Supervisor hired? Yes, so you have the, his resume there. Um, he couldn't be here. Um, he's gone through uh, the interview process. There were three candidates. This guy came out on, on top. Um, Diane was in the, in the original interview with him, as well as myself, the Public Works Board, and Tom. Um, and this is the, the recommended candidate. Um, he, has, he has all the credentials. He went on a tour of the system on uh, Saturday as well uh, with the Public Works Board. Um, he, uh, again, he, he's the top candidate out of the four applicants and three that were interviewed. Uh, he's local from Barrie. Um, he's got uh, a ton of experience and knowledge. Uh, he has his licenses as well. Uh, we have. Uh, Again, if the, if the board agrees to it tonight, we have an offer letter prepared, um, and he would be willing. He's, he's ready to start right after the first of the year. That name sounds really familiar. <laughs> he's been in Barry for 15 Long years, time. I think he said. Yeah, Barry Town. So you've probably come across him. make the motion to move forward with the offer of the position to the individual that's been presented to us this evening? I have a second that motion. Any further discussion on this? Yeah, well, we uh, be having, uh, I know with the assistant uh, treasurer position, we, we were kind of unsure about really the, the amount of salary and benefits. For this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, that, is that clear cut on this? It or? is. It is. It's paid for by Public Works Group as well. Comes out of their budget. Yeah. Out of their field. The, the, the budgeting. Starting salary is 80 that they've offered him. I think all said and done with insurance and everything, it's around 121 That's total what package. Asked. So it's about 21. It's 121 total package. And the, salary and benefits. The, uh, how many, what's the vacation look like? Two like? weeks. We will start. Start off. Well, it's a plus. He's got the water operator's license certification right away. So, yeah. Good background. Great experience. What does that do with their contract with Simons? And well, that's that's the uh, discussion that the Public Works Board and, and we are having right now. Um, there's some debate about the length of time that we'll need Simons on board after he comes on. Um, the thought is to get him on board, give him a month or so to evaluate it, and then uh, and make a decision at that point. And the expectation is, is for Simon is probably about two months after hire. And right? Simon's annual contract is what? Uh, I want to say it's a, the annual is like 58. Yeah, just shy of 60. Yeah. I think it's about 58. Okay. Yeah. Just their annual. And this, this salary you said was coming out of Public Works Fund? Public Works Fund. Yep. And how are they looking? Are they in good shape? Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, no issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they should they be able to okay. run their they, own. They, 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 <laughs> there will still be a surplus. Yes. The only question I have on this, Vince, in terms of this letter is the indication of a probationary period for at least one year. I've never seen that before where it's not set in stone of six months or one year. It says at least one year. Is there a reason? No, that that's, that that's what the noted Public that Works Board came up and, uh, and recommended. Mm -hmm. And then my other question, real quick, the other contract we have with the subcontractors that yep. are currently doing what, what was is there is two right there's two two contracts and those are both one's water one's sewer yeah and the contract with the sewer the other contract do you know what that that was how much that was 
about 65. I think that's 65. 62 to 65 in that range. And then the water side? The other? Like 58. 58. Those are the 58. Okay. But those won't necessarily be eliminated because they're actually doing the work, the one, actual construction. The, yeah, but the, one, the, one the water one can be done fairly quickly. The, the sewer one, there's still some discussion on. That'll probably decrease. But this one, yeah, it sure when does. Simons goes away, that one will go away, but then the other. Hey, makes sense to me, yeah. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, approval of licenses, permits, vouchers, and applications. I make the motion to approve payroll, payroll warrant 23-09 for payroll from October 9th to October 22nd of this year, paid on October 22nd of this year in the amount of $52,897.71. Also payroll warrant 23-10 for payroll from October 23rd to November 5th of this year, paid on November 9th in the amount of $49,334.27. Also payable warrant 23 GOE with checks 22395 to 22443 for payables in the amount of $268,880.59. Payable warrant ACH payment number two to VITA through ACH withdrawal on October 18th of this year in the amount of $20,518.02 for the Fisher Road Culvert Project payment number two. Reconcile bank statements for the month of September and October for the general fund checking account and the sewer water checking account also. Do you have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, approval of October 20th, 2022. Uh, minutes. I make the motion to approve the October 20th, 22 minutes as presented with just some um, changes here and there, which I'll share with Vince. Missing of substance. Substance, and um, it includes spelling of names um, and just the way things are worded. Um, so I've made notations throughout. You said, you said you had questions about the substance of it? You had said substance. I, that's what I thought I heard you say was yeah. substance. Yeah. So the issues that are in here are spelling of names are oh, okay. inaccurate. And then there's just some As long as it's factual, that's all I'm worried about. Yes, it's all, it's all factual in terms of names okay. and checking spellings and then, you know, just making it consistent throughout. Just, just to be clear, there, there's two minutes from the 20th. Okay. Yes, and I would say the same thing for both of those. So my motion includes both of the minutes for October 20th. The issues are the same for both of those. And I've made the notations and I will give those to Vince. I'll second that. I believe I can. I think I was here for that one. I don't think I was here for the 27th one. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. And now the uh, approval minutes of uh, October 27, 2022. I make the motion to approve the Thursday, October 27, 2022 minutes. Just slight changes to, you know, spacing and capitalization and names and titles and things of that nature. Your second. I couldn't, I couldn't. Your second? I'll second. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. Uh, Joe, round table. Um, well, I did give Vince, I believe, the the rate, the estimate for the radios. Yeah. And I never made it to the packet. It did not. Okay. One of the things I think with your new uh, new employee, if when he comes on board, is maybe maybe explore the idea of expanding or the extension of the water main 
from Montpelier to Barry. We had there, there's a whole yes. lot of it. I think there's a, honestly, I think there's a higher priority, which is our sewer line. Yeah. Right? 302 is a good example. Now we've had an issue with the hospital line as well. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a lot of unknowns with regards to our older sewer system and the lines, where they go, what's <laughs> what, the condition. Um, and with the recent event uh, with the, the hospital line, um, it, it wasn't good. Um, and there, again, it's, it's due to some surprises um, that we should have a better handle on, quite, quite frankly. But I think that will be our, should be, my, my opinion is that should be our priority to have them get a full understanding of what we're really dealing with, with regards to that, um, then there's more to come on that. It's, uh, it wasn't a good situation there at all. And it's gonna be costly as well to repair. Um, but you're right, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity there for, on the water side as well. And, and the radio, the estimate for the radio for the EOC? Yeah, I will send that out. To, to everybody as a follow-up as well. That would help to, to get that done. Thank you. Anything else? All set? Yeah. Uh, um, maybe just to continue, I think there was a, um, there were some people that were calling on the back roads in the last week or so. Uh, I do want to make note that uh, Tim and the road crew got out and addressed those. Yeah. Uh, but we also got to realize that that's, um, and, and I'm not saying it's a, um, it's an you know a te uh, employee or equipment operator issue. I firmly believe that we have a material issue, and we just spent a whole lot of money. I saw going out to you know the people up in the Graniteville area. I think we have resident. We have two sources right here in town that I think would be well worth looking at. For and materials. We, for materials. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure where Lagu is currently, but what used to be um, FL Brusso Stone Products, the top mm -hmm. 63. Yeah. Okay, is now McCullough. The slate, you're talking about the slate versus the ground. I'm going to tell you, you start language. talking about slate, because that's a scary word to a lot of people. Yep. Okay, I have been testing material since 2006, and that is good material up there. Just saying. The old Bruce's pit. The old Bruce's pit. Yeah, oh, 63. Yeah. I don't see a lot coming out of Lagu's pit lately. No. Huh. Every, well, the town's getting most of it from Pike up in there. Uh, it's not Pike. But that's also an option as well. You got Pike Industries down on Route 14. And you could look at Pike Industries, you can look at the old, uh, well, now the McCullough. And you can look at Lagu, and it's all very similar. Mm. Um, I think they got a bad time. rap. I think yeah. Lagu got a bad rap in the early 2000s on a big project for the yeah. state, and where there was a lot of tire issues. Okay, yeah. I don't know where they currently are. They do a lot of local uh, small projects, so that's kind of off the radar for me. But yeah. It's just that this stuff is what we're using currently. It's just unraveling. Not There's not sure. enough of the fines. The, the compact. If you want to call it uh, clay-like material, the plasticity yeah. it is very low. In fact, it is nothing, and so it doesn't hold. It doesn't bond it, and that's why we have what we have on these backgrounds. Take just a look say. at other options. Okay. Anything else, Joe? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Well. I wanted to share that I've had a lot of people come forward with positive um, feedback regarding the open forum that we did at the Berlin Grange, and I wanted to thank Orca Media. I think they did a really wonderful job in, in coming in and filming and also opening that up to the residents of Berlin, and there was a great attendance, um, so that means a lot to me and I believe the rest of the board as well. And. Um, the only other thing is I just wanted to touch on Lover's Lane Bridge again to see if we can request the state to be more decisive. I know you said, Vince, that they had indicated three to five years. Um, if we can get a more definitive 
you know, versus a three to five year. I think the residents really are seeking something more firm. Tell them to call their local representative. <laughs> I, and I, we appreciate I, what the representatives a, are doing for I, sure. Yeah, I've got a contact that I'm talking with. I told them I'll call them every quarter to get an update and, and see where we're at on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than Thank that, you. If, if you've got any ideas on how to leverage with the state, I'm all open to <laughs> 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 I just, what I've heard from the residents is how long it's been down and that um, Tucker's business isn't operating and that trucks aren't yeah. going yeah. over any longer and some residents would like to see it opened just to normal traffic it, if there it's was not a way right, now. right and and I know that too um, so those are just some concerns that have been brought forward so I appreciate everything you're doing and what the representatives are doing as well thank you that's yep. it thank Carol. you no, I just want to, on the on the what this individual we're hiring, looking at those things, I think that the Public Works Board is going to save some money down the road, you know, eliminate one of them contracts. And, you know, it ain't going to be immediate, but I think that it's going to be pretty level out fairly fast. So. Good point. So I, I did have a half my thought. It was David's turn, and we forgot him. I didn't want David to get forgotten. So <laughs> my... Uh, my roundtable uh, topic, and I, I specifically didn't bring it up uh, when uh, Rick DeAngelis was here from Good Samaritan because Good Samaritan is specifically a nonprofit organization. But I don't know if any of you read the Times Argus Rutland Herald last week about the Cortina Inn in Rutland. And um, the Cortina Inn in Rutland is our hilltop. Uh, they've been housing throughout COVID uh, over 150 uh, rooms to people experiencing homelessness and they've been very taxing on the police department uh, and it was very interesting. Um, the town has gone, and, and I'll read the quote from the Times Argus, uh, the town has gone as far to call a, for a review of the INS Act 250 permit uh, and that's in environmental court right now. And according to the select board chair, the town has worked out a deal with the Cortina Inn's owners in which uh, Cortina Inn will pay the town 75000 for two years of additional police services. And it will pay 22500 per month to the town until March 31st when it will stop housing people through the state program. So I know we've discussed it a little bit how uh, you know, we added an extra officer for for partially that reason, if not exclusively that reason. And uh, the business that is profiting from uh, the program that is taxing on our police force is is giving back to the town where it's costing the town a lot of money. So that's certainly something that I think we might want to consider in the future, near, near future. Uh, especially with the hiring of, of the new officer, um, if not because of that, very closely related because of that. Anything else? No, just don't forget we have executive session yep. with the chief. I entertain a motion to go into executive session. I make the motion to enter executive session to discuss a personnel issue with the chief of police. Uh, yes, Mr. Yeah. Do we have a name on the person you hired? To be public works director? Kurt here. Supervisor, not director. Uh, okay. Yes. Whatever you want to call him. <laughs> Craig Pelletier. Thank you. Craig Pelletier, thank you. Yes. 